recently, and then therefore I'm looking into ev uh, evolution of many RNA viruses. So just shortly, especially for the ones who did not have, who do not have a background in biology, th this is a cell. Everyone is familiar with cells, right? Uh, so you have nucleus, in case this is your cell, and your DNA is in your nucleus. So you can have RNA in your <coughs> nucleus, or you can ha have RNA in the cytoplasm in the rest of your cell. Uh, how we work on this, so we read all the sequences of those white wiggly things, and then some of them we see that they have something significant feature that tells us that this sequence might be virus. So then we extract all those sequences, see what's in common between them. So all of them have some middle peaks, similar. This, this is just representation of sequences which are letters A, T, C, G, or similar. And then what do I do? It, after we do comparative genomics, we make phylogenetic trees. Uh, phylogenetic trees, they show relationships uh, between viruses. So as you are probably similar to your sibling, a little bit more similar maybe to your parents, but you are less similar to your cousins or uncle, but you have a common ancestor, which maybe between your cousin and you is your grandparent. So that's the same with viruses. So we have families, we have genus in, in virus taxonomy. So for example, all of those, they have a common ancestor here, which would be, for example, your grandparent. And once you find many, many viruses, you can see who cluttered together, and then they should have something more in common in those sequencing comparisons. Um, and then we try to find new groups of viruses, or maybe something new, which is coming from different hosts. So this is just shortly what do I do. But what does Luke do? He's going to introduce himself, because Luke is that brave scientist who goes to uh, outbreak centers and then does the sequencing. Have you heard about Ebola outbreak? Yeah, you're about to. So you're going to hear even more about this. So welcome, Luke. Um, yeah, so thanks, thanks for that nice introduction. And yeah, just summarizing essentially what Agrita does. Uh, what my role is, is I use DNA sequencing to track viruses in an epidemiological sense, to, so to see where the virus is going, who's giving the virus to who, where it came from, these sorts of things. And probably one of the first things to say when you say outbreak, it conjures up this image of thousands of people in yellow suits walking around in hoods and all this sort of exciting things. That's not always the case. It can be a small number of things. Essentially an outbreak is just a larger number of infections than you'd normally see in that particular region. So it can be 10 people, it can be 100 people, or it can be a lot of people. So if we use Ebola as a case study, in the 40 years since it was discovered, so 1974 to 2014, there were 1,271 cases of Ebola. So about 40 cases a year. And prior to 2014, the biggest outbreak was 217 cases in, 200, uh, in 2007 in DRC. Jump to 2014 to 2016, there were 37,000 cases of Ebola with 14,000 deaths. So this was the largest recorded hemorrhagic fever outbreak ever in the world. And probably the one thing that you noticed during all of that was widespread fear and panic. The media just loved to put a big dramatic headline up there. Is Ebola airborne in the US? No. Can you catch Ebola on a plane? Probably not. Swine flu spreads. Mm -hmm. Of course it does. <laughs> so if you think, you know, Zika threat on your doorstep, if you live in Brazil, sure. Um, is a chicken a death threat? I don't think so. But AJ and Narayan will talk about Zika and flu in a minute. So why are outbreaks happening? Why do they happen so much? Well, generally speaking, one of the most common reason, reasons for this happening is transmission from a natural source. So animal reservoirs um, into the human population through food, contact, feces, urine, or similar. And as you can see, as the human nature interface gets closer and closer, so through farming, as our population gets bigger, people get closer to nature, not in a good way, um, outbreaks become almost inevitable. If you look at Africa as a sort of demonstration, this is the population density in 2014. This is deforestation. You can see it sort of overlaps nicely. As you'd expect, people need space to live. These are the Ebola outbreaks between 2014 and 2018. You can see there's an almost direct correlation between as you move closer and closer into nature, you're going to run into things that your body has not encountered before. So how does sequencing viruses help? And I'm going to start this playing now because it takes about a minute uh, to actually play. So by sequencing the virus, we can actually start off by identifying the causative agent of the outbreak. We can say where it came from. 
let's say how the virus is going from person to person. So you can see here, this is the virus spreading around the country. Each one of these arrows is a virus transmission event. So a person from here transmitted the virus to here, transmitted the virus to here. So using sequencing, we can say, this person that was infected over here, not a new outbreak. This is a case that's come from this outbreak over here. And you can see the virus spreads from a very small point to a very large area in a very fast period of time. So what we can do then is uh, determine whether the uh, vaccination or treatments will be effective. So we can look at the sequence of the virus and say, this will be treatable, this will respond to a vaccine or not. And we can sort of determine which measures will help to constrain the transmission. So in the context of this talk, Currently, there's about 100 outbreaks in the world of viruses that we know about. So this is just a map taken straight off the internet showing all the current outbreaks that are going on in the world. You've probably heard about Congo. You probably haven't heard about the other 99. So they're not huge outbreaks. They're not terribly worrying. Um, we know they're there. We know the disease. The problem is this, disease X, this unknown, rapidly transmissible disease that could potentially cause a global pandemic. Now, this is sort of leads into what uh, I name, sorry. Ingrid does, <laughs> looking for new viruses and these sorts of things. It's recognised by WHO as a genuine global health threat. So a virus that sort of nobody's ever seen before, we're not prepared for in any way, jumping out, infecting everybody, killing half the world. That's, that's a genuine concern for WHO, as it probably should be. So, using these portable sequencing methods, we can get to the places where this human nature interface is strongest and look straight away for the illness. And my last sort of point on this is it never happens on a beach. It never happens in a nice resort town. <laughs> it's always someplace horrible. <laughs> so it's always someplace hot. These are the places where we worked in the last three years. Nigeria, Sudan, Congo. Uh, not tourist hotspots, essentially. Um, so we essentially just take our kit with us, chuck in our suit, use our isolator, work out of the back of a car, work out of the back of a truck, work out of someone's office. Once we worked in the lobby of an airport, um, essentially anywhere there's a flat surface, we can take that virus and we can sequence it and say what's going on. And these are just some of the, the hit list of viruses and also some <coughs> bacteria that we found in amongst these outbreaks. Um, not exactly anything we would want to catch in there. And probably the last thing to say is it's very important. When we go in, we don't just go in, sequence the virus and leave. We go in, we teach everybody we can there how to sequence the virus as well. Because these guys, these local staff, they're going to be on the front line when the next disease virus hits. So they need to know as much as they can about the virus before and how to diagnose it and how to sequence it. So we always leave behind our equipment and teach them how to do these things. So I'll pass over now to Maria, I believe. Yeah, All right. Uh, so the next speaker will be Maria. Um, in the in initial event description, Maria was uh, said to be postdoctoral fellow or something, but in meantime, she now became a group leader. She's now building her own group to investigate Zika virus. How many of you heard about Zika virus? Not only by Luke previously. <laughs> so it's going to be definitely interesting for you. Um, so yeah, let's hear about another virus which infects <coughs> humans. So these two animals. Okay. So good evening to everyone. So, what do you think is going to be the most dangerous animal on earth for a human? Is this going to be a shark with all these teeth that can be like seven centimeters long, or is this going to be this tiny mosquito? So, what do you think? Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> the mosquito? Yeah, you're right. So, sharks do normally kill like 10 people per year. What happens with mosquitoes? So, infectious diseases transmitted by mosquitoes can cause almost 1 million deaths per year. And there are more than 500 viruses that can be transmitted by arthropods or insects. And this is what we call arbovirus, for arthropod born virus. Mosquitoes that can be transmitted, all these diseases are Anopheles, Culex, Aedes, Phlebotomus, or even pigs. And viruses that can be transmitted are Togavirus, Alphavirus, Flaviviruses, and Bunyan viruses. So, how is the transmission of this arbo arbovirus? Okay, so we can separate this into two the sylvatic, or more like the wildlife cycle and the urban which is more like the cities what is happening in towns or villages so everything that tend to start with an infect animal that in this case is going to be this monkey okay so this monkey is infected with a virus and then gets bitten by this mosquito now this mosquito gets infected and can infect either a different animal so that transmits this sympathetic cycle or can infect a human 
So this human is going to live in a more populated area where it's also going to be mosquitoes. So then the mosquito will get infected after bitten the human and that will transmit it into towns or cities. So most of the most dangerous viruses that are uh, arboviruses are transmitted by a family of mosquitoes which are, which are the Aedes mosquitoes. So which are these viruses? For example, dengue virus causes 100 million cases per year. Zika virus made the headlines three years ago, causing like lots of problems in Latin America. Zika virus causes arthritis and is starting to be well established in Southern Europe. And there are some other viruses like yellow fever virus or Japanese encephalitis virus that are also transmitted by these Aedes mosquitoes. So actually, of the, all the whole family, these are these two guys, the ones that are really causing all the problems. Here is Aedes aegypti, which is the main vector for all these diseases. And you can see it's basically distributed here in orange and red in all the equatorial and the tropical regions. But there is also the cousin, which is Aedes albopictus, also known as the tiger mosquito, because it has all these white stripes here in the body, which are not only in the equatorial and tropical places, but also in some warmer places, like here in the States, in Europe, and South America, Uruguay, and Argentina. If we have a closer look, here in Europe, this mosquito arrived 10 years ago, and since then has been able to colonize the whole Mediterranean from Greece to Spain. So why is this happening? A bit what you said, but it seems that now we are having more and more viruses appearing and emerging and emerging. So there are different factors. Uh, the first one are viral factors. As Ingrida said, these viruses are RNA viruses, so they tend to mutate more often. And with this higher mutation rate, they can adapt to better conditions and situations. There are also human factors. As Luke said, most of 50% of the world population live in big cities. So that means overcrowding, pollution, and lack of hygiene that enables <coughs> respiratory and intestinal infection. Also globalization and trans-oceanic trips. That means that we can have uh, a person infected with dengue in Australia and in less than 24 hours it's going to be in Europe and then if there is a, a vector, so a mosquito that can bite that person that can produce an outbreak in Europe. And also environmental factors, now we are living in a situation in which we have climate change and global warming and this is especially significant for mosquitoes because a mosquito's population are basically expanding. Also there are uh, climate phenomena such as El Niño which is also important for arboviruses and please don't forget there is always a relationship between climate change, disease and poverty. So the most socioeconomically deprived populations are going to be the most vulnerable ones. So as uh, Ingrida said, I started my own uh, group six months ago working on Zika. So Zika means overgrown in the Luganda language and was first isolated in Uganda in 1947. It was the greatest unknown, even for virologists until the first outbreaks in the Pacific and the French Polynesia in 2007 and 13, and the 2014 World Cup in Brazil introduced it to Latin America and that spread across Ameri the Americas. So normally, if you get infected by Zika, you won't have any symptoms or the symptoms will be very, very mild. But if you are pregnant and you get infected, that can cause microcephaly in the fetus. That means a smaller head, as we can see here with this baby. And if you're an adult, you can have the Guillain-Barret syndrome, which is an autoimmune disorder that slowly paralyzes your muscles. So far, there is no vaccine and not a specific antiviral drug. The transmission cycle is as we described before, but some other modes of transmission in this case. This virus can be sexually transmitted and also from mother to fetus. So that means that the virus has spread to more regions than that was expected. And all the, uh, all the virus is not making the headlines any longer. It, this outbreak has had like lots of social consequences. During that outbreak, health authorities of the affected countries recommended <coughs> to postpone the pregnancies between six months and two years during the course of the outbreak. But we need to know that women living in those affected areas, basically Latin America and Southeast Asia, they have little access to sex education, contraception, and therapeutic abortion. So that has forced many women to clandestine and unsafe abortion. Now, the fourth leading cause of maternal mortality in Brazil is clandestine abortions. And also, please 
you need to know that abortion is severely criminalized in most Latin American countries and has been punished with sentences up to 20 to 30 years. So that has caused a lot of stigma and discrimination, especially for women affected by the virus and also children. This is why we need to keep studying all these viruses, even if the outbreak is over. Thank you very much. So Maria mentioned like hygiene is important and like washing hands. And if we do not wash hands during winter time, there is a very high chance you get flu. So who got a flu jab this year? I got one. Well done. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> that would be suspicious. <laughs> uh, yeah, so even though some viruses can be easily caught by vaccines and so on, the flu is not that easy. So we all need every year to get uh, vaccinated. And about flu, even though it, it has caused many, uh, like for us, it's not that dangerous, right? Like we all are here happy and healthy, uh, even though the ones who did not get a flu a vaccination, you are still happy and healthy in here. Uh, but there are some types of flu which can cause millions of deaths. Uh, but luckily, we have a person in our room who knows how to deal with such flu viruses. So AJ, <laughs> the stage is yours. Do you want these are, and this is the point. Right, so Maria and Luke already talked about outbreaks. And for us, it would be very, very dangerous if, if one of those outbreaks will blossom into something uh, as big as a pandemic. Now, the most notorious and uh, deadly pandemic that we've encountered in the last uh, century is the 1918 influenza pandemic, which killed a current estimated between 50 and 100 million people. Um, environment, environmental factors played an important role. So it was just after the war, there was malnutrition, but there was also something special about this virus. Um, and we're trying to understand what this is and if this could occur again. again. And um, the answer to the last question is probably yes, because uh, we frequently see uh, new flu virus strains emerge, most often in, in markets in Asia, as you can see just here, where people live in close proximity to uh, ducks and, and chickens who may be infected with avian influenza virus types. And because they live in such proximity, those viruses can jump over to humans and uh, start causing disease in us um, with severe consequences. So that's sort of the the, the story that I want to focus a bit on. And, and some of these viruses that I've pointed out that could jump from birds to humans, you may have seen them in the newspapers, H1N1, H5N1, H7N1. These are just numbers indicating the differences at a genetic level between the different viruses. Now, so this is the basic premise. You have a virus that normally uh, is present in, in birds, in ducks, in chickens. Um, and it's not causing much disease. It's, it's adapted to those animals. It's replicating happily. And the animals, yeah, don't suffer too much. But then it jumps over if the circumstances allow this, and uh, it starts replicating in our lungs. Now in ducks, for instance, the virus replicates in the gut. So it's a completely different environment, different cell types, also different body temperatures. And as a result, we think this uh, triggers something that kills us. Now, let me zoom into a little bit more detail to what we think is happening. So we have a virus that enters our respiratory tract, particularly the lower parts of uh, our lungs. And normally this shouldn't be a problem if we have the normal season of flu strains, uh, which if you're healthy, you can cope with them, because we have uh, white blood cells, we have antibodies who can neutralize the virus to a certain extent. Um, but when you have an infection with the virus that you've never seen before, and a virus that is replicating an environment that the virus has never seen, um, your immune system can overreact. And you get too much white blood cell infiltration into your lungs, and as a result, you can see us here, so this is an um, image of a normal healthy lung, so you can see thin layers of cells um, that contain small uh, blood vessels and then large spaces that contain all the air, carbon dioxide, oxygen, that needs to be exchanged, be exchanged across these small layers of cells. When, when you have an infection, all that air space is gone. It's been infiltrated with white blood cells, 
So the resulting pneumonia basically prevents you from breathing and you start to drown in your own body fluids. So it's your body trying to do something about the virus, but it's too eager, too keen to do this. Um, now, and what they think is behind this is a very basic mechanism that your body uses to detect foreign material. It, it sort of looks out for foreign proteins, viral genetic material that, it, that normally shouldn't be there. And um, usually you have a balance between how well your body is able to detect this and how well the virus is adapted to hiding its components from your cells. And when this balance goes um, one way or the other, so you, your body could be uh, immunocompromised, so you're not able to detect uh, the virus very well, so you get very ill. But if you go the other way, the virus exposes itself too much, you get too strong of an immune response, and as a result, um, these severe pneumonias that we see in, for instance, the 1918 infection. Um, so not only our environment, where we live, and uh, what we encounter is important. It's also important what the virus encounters and how it is adapted to this. And uh, that's what we're studying in our lab at the molecular detail. I think that's it. So did you not waste time um, and prepare for our discussion? I will invite our other Noria and Luke to take the stage and let's take chairs a bit more to the center. So get ready uh, and prepare your questions. So because we have only half an hour left, uh, if your question is not being answered, you have like sheets uh, of paper that all four of us on it. Uh, there is our Twitter accounts, our emails, um, and there is Slido uh, on our site. So feel free to put your questions there. If we run out of time, and if you put your question on Slido, we will try to answer it, film it, and put it like on YouTube or Twitter again or Facebook. Um, so we will try to make our best to answer your questions, okay? So who's gonna be, oh, and we have encouragement. Everyone who asks the question gets uh, chocolate. <laughs> so uh, be aware, we have some of them who have hazelnuts. So if you're allergic to nuts, hazelnut is like probably not a good choice for you. <laughs> and there's milk chocolate. So if you're lactose intolerant, don't take that home. <laughs> um, or you can, but don't sue us. Um, uh, and Lisa will help with that. So who's going to be the first one to ask the question? Yay. Are there beneficial viruses, for example, ones that will help you get rid of um, bacteria that are, are not helpful, particular bacteria that might not be helpful? Uh, yes, so <laughs> bacteria can be infected by viruses as well. They're, they're called bacteriophages, basically. And they're currently being developed as a method to destroy uh, bacteria in, in our uh, bodies, basically, as an alternative to antibiotics. But it doesn't happen naturally. It happens naturally as well, yes. And because those viruses are perfectly adapted to going into bacteria and destroying them, um, they don't recognize ourselves. But are they specifically for ones that are for the bacteria that are harmful to us? Will they not attack the other ones at all? That's for the delicate balance. Right. Yes. That's what they do tend to be quite specific for certain bacteria. Right. So they might be like a new resource after all the resistance to antibiotics. So they are trying to study that. And if that the, the were like in Soviet Union and Kyrgyzstan? Kyrgyzstan? Georgia? In Georgia, yeah. They still do phages therapy. And they have a massive bank of all different phages of, against different bacteria. So if we run into full antibiotic resistance, we might... <laughs> buy some tickets to this beautiful country. <laughs> so, who's going to ask the next question? Okay. Uh, when you had the, the, the image of the duck before and the human, what has to change on a virus so it can transmit to another species? So there, there are a couple of changes that are required for this. Um, one is that it needs to bind the right receptors. Um, so the receptors that you see, for instance, in, in the duck gut, they are present in the human uh, lower parts of the, the respiratory tract. So those are present, which is why the virus likes to go there. Um, 
but it also needs to uh, transmit well between humans. That requires some adaptations and needs to be able to replicate fast enough in our cells, so that also requires some changes in the enzymes that copy the viral genome. So there are about four or five steps required to make that efficient. I would say it, it doesn't happen that often. So you don't get this jump from animal to human that frequently. It's only as you get more and more pressure at the moment of people and animals just constantly exposed to each other that it's sort of happening a little bit more frequently. And this is kind of the point, right, why, for example, in my case, we are looking to many different samples of sequencing which are non-human uh, samples because Previously, we probably did all sequencing on all possible humans or like pets or something that was around us, livestock. Um, but we, for for example, for arthropods like insects and so on, uh, it has been so now like we are flourishing. We like there are loads of groups who are like sequencing, and we are finding every year like hundreds of new viruses. Um, so therefore, if something jumps, then we are prepared maybe for next outbreak a bit better. This is like. Uh so like BSC was slightly different when it was like a protein that you add to, the, to get vitality, is that right? It's the prion prion. Yeah. yeah. Is there any, can viruses be done by cooking so they can be transmitted through food? Or? Some viruses can, yeah. So non envelope viruses in particular are quite resistant to environmental factors like heat, um, detergent, these sorts of things. Envelope viruses, which are RNA viruses, tend to be uh, light detergent, can usually get rid of them, so they're not quite as Prions are entirely different. They're just a, a fragment of nucleic acid, basically, which lasts pretty much anything. Okay, next question. Um, I have a question about in outbreaks. Um, I'm interested to know more about, obviously, time is of the essence when you're trying to contain something or understand what's causing an outbreak. Um, so I'm interested to know what the steps are that you have to go through between someone saying, there's an outbreak, and you going, we have it under Thanks for the small question. <laughs> As I say, the first thing you would have to do is that the country has to be. So depending on the size of the outbreak, it can be an internal outbreak or an external. So if it's, say, Adam Brooks Hospital and there's a norovirus outbreak, the hospital will deal with that. So they'll just use normal things like separation of patients, washing of hands, these sorts of things to track it and keep it local. If you're talking about an outbreak in Sierra Leone, for example, the country has to notify health authorities. They don't have the infrastructure in place to deal with this. So it becomes a governmental issue. So not just governmental. So organizations like MSF and these guys will say, we have a problem. You know, we have a virus infection here, not seen it here before. They'll notify the Ministry of Health. At some point, when the problem becomes so bad you can't do anything about it, the Ministry of Health will notify the World Health Organization and say, we need help. We need a response to this. And so that will then mobilize doctors and treatment organizations, these sorts of things, to come into the country and start helping, assuming they don't have the infrastructure in place in the first place. Once that's started, um, it depends on all sorts of factors. The country could have a military response, which will physically quarantine people. It could have a social response saying, we'll give you money not to touch people. It just varies depending on the country. What stops it in the end is essentially keeping people so just stopping people touching, washing your hands, not burying bodies unsafely, these sorts of things. So stopping people from flying to the neighboring <coughs> countries, little things like that will stop the virus from spreading. But it's a big mechanism <laughs> to get that going in an outbreak in a foreign country. Do you think politics are more important or educating people? Educating people. I think this is the one thing I'd say. Um, following on from the Ebola outbreak, a lot of effort went into educating people saying, wash your hands. Don't bury bodies in the river. Don't touch the dead bodies. Like the, these sorts of things, which will hopefully catch on and sort of help stop that from happening in the future. Um, politics hasn't changed, <laughs> so that's that's still. No, nobody wants to admit in their country we have a problem. Like it just doesn't look great. So that that's going to be a very large shift to say, okay, you've got a problem. Fine, let's fix it. Chocolates go for the question master. Okay. Um, the about the link between beta and the um, I think it's quite insane for causality between the two and the 
Sorry, can you repeat a bit louder? Um, the initial link between he and barring um, the um, and although the link shows the causality is not known, um, like why is it the reason why causes is also in the Um, I don't think that that's something that is has. Well, they know there has been a link of people, especially in France, Polynesia, that there was like a huge kind of peak of people having the Guillain-Barré syndrome. And then in retrospective, after all the outbreaks, they were able to detect Zika in all those patients. So it's probably more like the disorder because this is autoimmune disorder, basically. So the virus will produce some kind of antibodies that somehow is going to react with your own uh, nerves in this case. So this is what is actually what is happening. Uh, then we know why is this causing this, and basically why it really started to cause this after 2007 and not before, because the virus was basically isolated in the mid 50s. So what has happened in these 60 years to make the virus to change? And that's something that at least I'm interested in is to know what's happening the changes between the original the African virus that doesn't seem to be causing any of this and what is happening after 2007. Okay, great. Where are we going to have the next question? Yes. Are there any viruses out there which we might want to encourage? You know, things like a virus that lives in the ocean and eats plastic or kicks in carbon dioxide or, or, or is that more the realm of um, bacteria? Or I'd say that's that probably more the realm of bacteria. Um, viruses need <coughs> cells. They need need cells cells to replicate because it. they need cells, yeah. Yeah. they don't sort of fr live freely in the, in the environment. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that comes to one of our questions that we got on Slido. Are viruses <coughs> living like organisms mm. uh, or whatever? Yeah, I think this is like the biggest philosophical discussion you can probably have. <laughs> um, but I guess in that case, it just... So viruses use whatever is in there, uh, in that ocean. Or like, and plastic is not cell, right? So it's just like chemical. Yeah. And viruses do not have metabolism on their own. Yeah. Um, so we can use maybe viruses to control bacteria, which does all the cleaning jobs. So well, afterwards, yeah. we don't have pollination mm. by bacteria mm. <laughs> in but, the ocean. But on the point of viruses being useful, mm. they have given us uh, very important tools to study how mm. cells work. Um, how you do your PCR reactions to set up sequencing. L l a lot of those enzymes um, have been isolated from viruses because we were studying them initially for health reasons and we found out like, oh, they actually have contained very useful things that we can repurpose. And they can, that's the other thing, repurposing viruses, you can, they're quite easy to manipulate, so you can target living things, so cancer cells, so and these sorts of things, degenerative conditions, they might be down the line useful perhaps. So, but the plastic and things, they're not living. On, on that point, it's just like, I just want to commercialize my lab. <laughs> so, like, our main goal is basically why we are looking for new viruses. We try to find new molecular mechanisms that they employ. Um, because the RNA viruses, they have very short genomes, so they, but they still need to encode all the needed proteins in there. So they have very interesting and unusual um, translation protein producing mechanisms. So just from a molecular biology point of view, viruses are extremely interesting. And then you can use those like new biotechnological tools to make like drugs and that kind of stuff. You can't say on that, but publicize that. We don't want to find any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, chocolates are coming. Uh, so who's going to ask the next question? Yes, sir. It seems to be much more difficult to develop antiviral drugs than it was to develop antibacterial drugs. I don't know why that was. I, I don't know. It's because the virus is basically using all the cellular machinery, so everything that we are going to target is going to target our cells. So this is why it's so difficult to find like a very good antiviral. So it needs to be only a very specific protein that is going to be only from virus origin. So this is why this is why bacteria is more easier to try to develop things, especially because they do tend to do that. So antibiotics are something that bacteria do produce to compete with other bacteria. So we only need to isolate the, the substance for that. And they do tend to be more independent, so this is why we can target bacteria more easily than viruses that basically depend on us. But I think on that point also that we kind of use all what we know how to fight bacteria. So maybe in the next like century it's gonna be 
comparably, it's not easier to create antiviral drugs, but it's going to be way much more difficult to create antibacterial drugs. So, yeah, that's that point. Um, <laughs> okay, the next one. Yeah, how much uh, climate change, global warming, will have to be before both mosquito vectors are able to survive in the UK? <laughs> <laughs> so probably after last summer, not much. <laughs> so do you have to think that mostly, like roughly 50% of the world population nowadays is facing, so can encounter all these mosquitoes. So basically they can encounter all these viruses. So, I mean, I, I come from Spain, and last year, so last summer, it was the first cases of dengue after 100 years, so, and that has come to stay. And people travel more and more. I think there's that globalization also thing, so even though you are British, you still go on holiday. <laughs> no, but the thing is, like, do we have the competent vector in the UK? Probably mm -hmm. not now, but it's still with climate change. Maybe we only need to wait, like, 10 years, 15 years, and then that we're having here as well. So maybe continuing from that point for our panel, there's a question on Slido. How long have we got until the next pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> Each can give a try. <laughs> interesting, interesting question. So I, I would say that with the more information that we get about, you know, when we harvest d DNA and genetics and stuff like that, there are large outbreaks going on already that we didn't know about. So there's a case in uh, Nigeria where yellow fever has been spreading. There's thousands of cases that nobody knew about. Um, and we only found it by mining data, you know, by doing that. So in terms of the next pandemic, um, we're probably overdue, <laughs> to be honest. Um, a lot of intervention has helped, but I'd, I'd say without really careful management of populations and these sorts of things, yeah, soon. How about the point maybe if you want to touch on anti-vaccination? <laughs> Go I'll let someone else do that. <laughs> <laughs> I <don't know>. Vaccinate, <laughs> do it. <laughs> like if, if all stop vac uh, not vaccinate, if, if everyone stops vaccinating, probably we will have pandemic more free. Like, yeah, right. Like it, it's close. It's happening, kind of. Kind of is. Yeah. If you look at measles, for example, it transmits very easily from person to person. So. The, the fewer people are vaccinated against that, the more people it's going to get to. And so, so like every year in Europe, it was like, I think initially, like three years ago, it was like 5,000 cases. Like this year, it was like over 40,000 cases. So it's like exponentially growing. Um, so that's a really big, I think, concern. Um, yeah. But probably if you are here, you already are quite interested in virology and you know this thing. Uh, um, what's the next yeah, question? Oh, we have one in 2009. Okay, so we missed it. Okay. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? There are caves or an example where animals use or we need virus. Where they need it? Yeah. Um, the, the most brilliant example that I've seen was a sea slug using a retrovirus to extract chloroplasts, so the green, basically the, the organelles that allow plants to photosynthesize and use light to create energy, to get extract those chloroplasts from the plants and then use it themselves. Um, that I thought was pretty cool. So the slug basically turns completely green and starts to be able to photosynthesize for a short period of time. And then I think a very famous example is um, also the placenta, which depends on some viral proteins being expressed. Um, it has been demonstrated in, in sheep in particular. On placenta, there's a talk on Friday uh, in our department. So you can come and listen about that. Yeah. Chocolates go. What's the next, next question? Hmm? Yeah, just uh, Okay, so that's a super interesting question and very complicated. 
So, uh, Zika virus has, uh, can cross-react with dengue virus, okay? And there are four uh, serotypes of dengue, so one to four. Uh, we cannot create a vaccine against dengue, and the thing is because dengue can cause something which is called antibody-dependent enhancement. So when you are producing antibodies, so as an example, you get infected with dengue one. So you produce antibodies against dengue 1, and that's fine. What happens? So uh, next year you get infected with dengue 2, and your antibodies can recognize dengue 2 somehow, but not 100%. So instead of killing the virus, what is going to be those antibodies is to get the virus inside your cells more easily. So you are going to have an ex exacerbated disease. Okay? So this is why it's super typical to create a vaccine against dengue because you need to have something that is going to be able to protect 100% uh, against everything. And so far, it has been unable to produce that. What happens with Zika? Zika. So Zika can react with dengue. So sometimes it's called like dengue 5. So if you want to create a vaccine against Zika, probably you also need to include uh, the vaccine against dengue 1 to 4. So we are just increasing the complexity of the vaccine. So there have been some trials only against Zika and that works, the thing is, like, would you risk yourself to get vaccinated with this and then get infected with dengue later and have a worse disease or not? Well, we have Veronica in the second row. <laughs> okay, bring the chocolate to Veronica because she asked us a question. Is there any possible way to modify mosquitoes so they don't transmit the virus? Uh, yeah, so they are doing that. So they are releasing uh, genetically modified mosquitoes in which basically what happens, they won't be an offspring. So the mosquitoes are dead. So that's kind of the way of not transmitting the, the virus. The thing is when you genetically modify an organism, maybe it's something that we shouldn't be doing because we are releasing something that we don't know what is going to happen in nature. So it's a bit do we have any more questions? Because we have like five, six minutes left. I can read from Slido, but I prefer someone who is definitely here to ask the question. Well, I've got one more. Um, <laughs> I, 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 was, I was watching a video on Ted about SARS, and he was like, it's not a cartoon thing, really, but he, he managed to trace back the exact hotel room where the first person had it. How, how did he do that? Is that just like fluke and he got caught first and they managed to trace it back? Or just something that goes in afterwards and rewind it? <laughs> if you look at the genetic sequence of the, like the last patient versus the first patient, you can track backwards with maps basically and say where the virus has been working its way backwards. So not just with SARS, but other viruses. You can use a molecular clock basically, which works backwards and tells you what the changes were and where was the terminal change. So who was patient zero, who was patient X. And it's crazy complicated and takes heaps of computer time and it's quite difficult to explain, so I'm not going to because I can't. Um, but essentially, you can just track the virus backwards to its first patient. So same with Ebola, you can say, six-year-old boy in Gekadu interacted with a bat at a certain time of month, ate the flesh, started the whole Ebola outbreak. So you can just track it backwards just by looking at the sequence data as it goes along and using epidemiological links along the way. Did we answer the question? Sorry? Did we answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any more questions? Can I ask a second one? Uh, yes, of course. We already like, have some. <laughs> That's good. Like This is a good example. Uh, are, the, are, the, are we full of harmless bacteria as well as we are with, with sorry, um, viruses as we are with bacteria? Yeah, so I think maybe this is where me and Luke knows it better. So for example, in any case, if you do sequencing, I can look for all different composition of many different viruses in that sample. So you find like tens, maybe yeah. <laughs> hundreds of different ones. So and then, yeah. yeah, we've got things like CMV, papillomavirus, these viruses, they're, they're in them, they're, they're commensals, they're virus. They don't do anything until something goes wrong with you. And like purpose virus, I think th there's like a number that basically everyone has it. And just once your immune system is like weakened by some 
I know, disease or something, then they can flourish and show all their evil side. And are, are they classified by, by their effects or by their structure? You mean taxonomically? Or well, when you're talking about different, different groups of... Uh, you, I mean, you wouldn't call it a harmless virus or anything. It just goes into a class, <laughs> so like a, a flavy virus, or a, it just gets classified by its structure. By its structure. It, yeah. It's more if we look into <coughs> protein sequence, and we know which part of... Pro so basically, there's only one protein which is kind of conserved among all RNA viruses, and we know how that protein looks in different like groups and families. And that usually, if you classify them by only that one protein, you can see that those group like those viruses who have that particular type of that protein, they usually have similar like genome structure, they have similar structure as virus, and they have similar hosts and so on. Um, so like this is why it starts, but then you start like fine tuning by other measurements. And like from 2011, now there's like um, international virus taxonomy, kind of not agency, but group, where they allow now only sequence based. So previously you need to sh take a picture through microscope of virus, show where it was infecting and so on. Now, because we are like in sequencing age, it's enough if I show you the sequence, I tell you every protein what, what is in there, and I can predict even how the virus will look like. So they allow you to submit such new virus uh, to the databases. Yeah. Some more questions, maybe. Yes? You talked about the, the problem of viruses transmitting across the world because we all like to travel. How practical is it to test people to see if they've got a virus in them before they become symptomatic? Is it possible to do that? No. Um, that, that's right. Well, it depends. So we're talking about something like six to eight billion people traveling around the world all the time. So trying to screen them for every possible virus, mm -hmm. virus that you can think of is not financially or person possible. We don't have enough people in the world to screen everybody for everything. Um, the measures they put in place like uh, increased body temperature, so scanners at the terminal to say this person's got a fever, check them, that sort of thing. Um, they're helpful to an extent, um, telling people to wash their hands, these sorts of things, you can do that. But screening them for disease is not as easy as it, as it sounds. It's usually quite a long, or not long, but it can take a day at least. So if you've got six billion people for a day, it's a lot of days. So it, it's not really feasible to screen everybody for every disease. And you may also have to ask for consent to take a, a swap from someone's throat or a blood sample. Uh, will complicate it as well. Yeah. And also, if you, you, know, you run into that, so if you take a blood sample from somebody, then the natural suspicion is that you're going to that into a government database saying so that people can track me. So the, the ethical and mm -hmm. practical problems with it are just huge. So it's probably better to wash your hands and yeah. get vaccination if it's needed to travel into yeah. that country before. Um, any more questions? Or we have... Okay, did you get the chocolate? Chocolate is important. This is a positive <laughs> treatment. Uh, um, so we have another question, this is probably for AJ. How come flu vaccine for child is only some mist in the nose, but for adult it's an infection? Uh, this has to do uh, with how the body responds to uh, the virus, basically, and the vaccine. So in children there's a different, different response than in adults. And we find that flu mist, which is the, the nose spray, which is a live attenuated virus, which replicates a little bit. This gives a better response in children than in adults where you just inject a dead virus, basically, or some protein of the virus in, in the muscle. Okay, and maybe just one more question from Slido. Once the virus has been read, what's, what is the next step? Once the virus has been read? Yes. Interesting question. Okay, so once, once you've read the virus, the next thing to do is to put it into bioinformatics, so seeing what the virus is, to see what the sequence is, see how that matches to other sequences, and see how that matches to other people in the area, whether it's a new virus or an old virus. Um, bioinformatics is what comes next, so you'd be better to explain that. <laughs> yeah, so then basically we just look what kind of, you read the sequence, and then you see where the proteins are, then you see if these proteins are similar to something else in the databases, and then sometimes it's like a perfect match, so you even know how the structurally in 3D it will look like. 
and you can go on and on. And once you have, you did all what you can for informatically, this is where experimental work comes in, where if you can, you try to show and prove by experiments, if it's needed. There are plenty of viruses which are probably will never be experimentally tested because there are just so many of them. Okay, um, it's already eight. Is anyone against if I ask one more question from Slido? Uh, meanwhile, uh, by the way, you all have feedback forms on your table. We added like one pen on each table. So if you can share or use your own and fill it in, it's brilliant. Uh, and meantime, while you're doing this or you are not doing this, I can ask another question from Slido. Uh, so I think it's also for everyone, kind of. How can the society be convinced that vaccination is needed in the light of anti-vaxxers movement? Why is so is it so difficult? Who wants to tackle this question? Well, I think that the thing is why we should face diseases that are almost eradicated. So why do we do we have the need to suffer from something that is almost eradicated for not vaccination? So for me, it's like. I think it comes back to what I just said, education. You really just have to go back to convincing people that the whole anti-vax thing is absolute rubbish and shouldn't be encouraged, it shouldn't be given any, you know, it's been disproved so many times. It should be sort of phased out in favor of education of the benefits of vaccines over the, the crazy, trendy thing of anti-vaccination. I think uh, probably also allowing people to appreciate what a vaccine is. You're basically allowing your, you're exposing your body just to a bit of the virus, just a bit of the protein. So normally, like a child would rub its nose or its hand, hands in, in the mud and stick that mud down in its mouth, and that will expose it to some of the bacteria and viruses in that mud. Now we're just taking a bit of purified protein, a bit of purified virus, and show that to your body so you can respond to that, make antibodies to get it against it. So the next time you can protect yourself. It's kind of the same mechanisms uh, that to the theory not behind it. And I think why it's so difficult is just naturally, usually parents who have no knowledge in biology, if they hear some kind of threat for their kid, which might happen, even though it's like fake news, uh, they gonna be suspicious about that. So I would encourage like scientists, like from the biological background. So sometimes I do this, like I make myself like really calming some chamomile tea. <laughs> open Facebook and go into <laughs> comment sections and just calmly try to explain and answer the questions of those parents. Because there is a part of anti-vaxxers who can be changed. They are just like really worrying for their kids. Um, so we should not, you know, confront them. We should have a discussion. There are, of course, the ones which will believe in flat earth. Um, so we can't do anything with them. Okay, so as it is already five after eight, does anyone have any like one question that definitely wants to ask? No? So then feel free even after the event to put it on Slido if some questions has not been answered. And we are really happy that you all came here. Uh, and the science festival at the Department of Pathology does not end today. So there is a talk on Friday. Uh, does uh, other mother reject the fetus? And Saturday, this Saturday, on March 16th, uh, we have plenty of events. I think we all, more or less, like AJ definitely is going to be here, so you can come and ask even more questions, though he will have like a really fun virus roulette. Uh, we will have cat path where you can come and talk one-to-one -to, -one to every scientist that you probably want to meet. Um, so feel free to come on Saturday and then see you uh, on Saturday. Thank you.